The season 2 begins with Makoto heading to the city of Rosgard. Right now, he's in Abbot City, and he's tired from walking. Shiki tells him that walking is better than getting caught by the goddess while teleporting. Makoto blames everything on the goddess. Shiki says they're almost in Rosgard and promises to find a good inn for them. He asks Makoto to grab some food while he sorts that out. Makoto is okay with any, but Shiki wants a nice one because Tamo and Mio will be upset if he picks a cheap one. Makoto wonders if leaving them in charge of the Demiplane was a good idea. The story then switches to the Demiplane. Tamo discovers that Mio is interested in cooking and wants to make something Makoto likes. Tamo gets why but wonders how a simple taste test went so wrong. Mio doesn't know, and Tamo is glad she had Makoto's food tested for poison. Mio is offended and asks if Tamo is calling her food poison. She made curry rice based on Makoto's memories, but Tamo asks if she's ever eaten curry rice before. Mio says no because it's from another world, and she didn't ask Makoto for the recipe to surprise him. Emma asks if the green thing in the curry is an ore, and Mio says yes, thinking it would taste great. Bayan realizes she put soft emerald in the curry. Kamo mentions there's even a piece of the pot's handle in it, and Mio sees the pot has melted. Mio tastes the curry herself and thinks it's not terrible, but Tamo tells her that in their world, people and Makoto don't eat mineral ores, weapons, or buildings. Mio is shocked to learn these aren't considered food. Tamo asks if Mio knows how to cook, and she says she at least knows how to use fire. Tamo asks her to make slightly burned toast, but Mio burns it completely. Tamo says Mio has a lot to learn about cooking. The scene shifts back to Makoto, who's eating some blue meat at a restaurant. The owner asks him not to make a disgusted face while eating because his face is already unpleasant. Makoto overhears a conversation about Moon over the ruined castle and thinks it's a song. He later learns it's the name of a dangerous group of bandits. The girl wonders why nobody is willing to take on a quest to fight these bandits, even though she's willing to pay for it. The receptionist explains that these bandits are very fierce, and there are more than a hundred of them. The guild doesn't have enough strong fighters to deal with them right now, so the girl is told to come back next month when they'll have more help. She's upset and wonders if they've been abandoned by their goddess. Some guys try to take advantage of the girl, but she runs out of the guild in tears, and Makoto notices this. Later, Makoto is in an alley and regrets paying with a gold coin. He uses his abilities to sense that three people have followed him from the restaurant, and he also sees that people from the guild are bothering the girl he saw earlier. Makoto defeats the guys from the restaurant and protects the girl by throwing them at the adventurers who were troubling her. Makoto defeats the remaining adventurers who were causing trouble. The girl, Rana, wonders if he helped them because he's a demi-human like her friend Ido. Makoto clarifies that he's human and uses his abilities to heal Ido's injury. Makoto introduces himself as an adventurer but mainly a merchant. Rana thanks Makoto for saving them and introduces herself as Rana from Tapa Village. Her friend, Ido, is a werewolf, but he's different from the werewolves Makoto had imagined. Makoto offers to carry Ido for her, and they start heading towards Rana's village. Makoto asks Rana about the bandits she mentioned earlier. Rana explains that the bandits attacked their village recently and brutally tortured their strongest member, Parley, to make an example. Now, the villagers are giving up their money and savings. She says every village they've visited suffered the same fate, and her village is in danger too. Ido wakes up and asks Rana if the guild will send help. Rana sadly reveals that the guild refused. Makoto reflects on the commonality of death in this world and realizes he hasn't fully accepted it yet. He decides to help them and asks Rana where her village is. Rana points to the mountains, and Makoto surprises them by jumping over to her village with Rana and Ido. The scene then shifts to Tapa Village, where Rana wants to thank Makoto properly. She asks him to wait while she informs the villagers about their arrival. Makoto wonders if Ido won't go after Rana, and Ido is surprised that Makoto can speak the werewolf language. Ido explains that it wouldn't be right for a demi-human to enter a human village. He mentions that his village is in the woods ahead, but Rana and some villagers are close by. Makoto uses his investigative skills to check the village and notices that the bandits have killed some people again. Makoto mentions that he knew Ido was awake when he was carrying him and wonders if Ido pretended to be unconscious because he felt responsible for putting Rana in danger. Ido agrees, and Makoto asks him to keep Rana safe if he wants to be with her. Makoto uses his investigative skills again and finds out that the bandits are currently in the mountains. He decides to go after them, ignoring Ido's warning. Ido asks Makoto why he's doing all this. Makoto explains that Moon over the ruined castle is the name of a song in his country, and he loves it. He doesn't like a group of bandits using that name, and he believes it's reason enough to stop them. He leaves to confront the bandits. The scene shifts to other residents of the Demiplane trying Mio's cooking again, but the results are still not good. 
Mio used premium ingredients this time and is puzzled by the outcome. Tamo notices that the dishes don't look or taste right and explains that great ingredients don't guarantee great taste. She points out that different races have different preferences and the residents share what kind of food they like. Mio realizes that cooking requires deep knowledge. Tamo suggests that Mio travel the world to improve her cooking skills, and Mio agrees, deciding to embark on a culinary journey for the sake of the young master. Everyone is happy with her decision. Tamo decides to start her own investigation to keep the young master out of trouble. The scene shifts to the bandits in the forest, planning their next move. Makoto puts on his mask to hide his identity, and uses a special power to silence all sounds around them. The bandit leader is surprised by the sudden silence, and Makoto starts shooting the bandits one by one. While he's shooting, Makoto reflects on his vow to stay out of human affairs, yet here he is, eliminating bandits to protect humans. He realizes that he acted on his emotions when he hesitated. After thinning the bandits' numbers, he realizes he hasn't killed them but only knocked them out. Makoto puts away his bow and uses fire magic to deal with the remaining bandits, causing an explosion that catches the villagers' attention. He tells the bandit leader that he won't kill them and asks them to change their group's name from Moon over the ruined castle. The scene shifts to the villagers finding the bandits tied to a tree. Rana asks Ito if Makoto did this, and Ito confirms it. She thanks the goddess for Makoto's help. Later, Makoto is with Shiki, who asks where he's been all day. Makoto says he was taking care of business, and asks if Shiki has found an inn. Shiki says he has, but it costs three gold coins a night. Shiki then mentions that the other heroes Makoto mentioned earlier have been well received in Linnea Kingdom and Gratonia Empire. He thinks it's unfair that Makoto is living a frugal life. Makoto explains that he saw other heroes when he was teleported to the battlefield and wonders if he'll ever meet them again. The story takes us back in time to the days before Makoto was summoned to another world. Makoto is just going about his usual day at school when a girl named Hibiki Atanashi approaches him. She points out that there's a mistake in the date on the document he received from the student council, and swaps it with the correct one. Makoto thanks her and leaves. Hibiki knows that Makoto, despite being called a hero, is just an average guy among a group of handsome student council members. Hibiki envies Makoto a bit because, for her, life has always been easy. She can achieve whatever she wants with little effort, and everything seems to go smoothly. But she finds her life boring. Then, unexpectedly, Hibiki gets summoned to another world. She's confused about where she is, and a goddess explains that she's in a different world. The goddess tells her that the world she's from is under attack by demons, facing a crisis like never before. The goddess hopes that Hibiki can help and plans to send her and another person as heroes. She offers to give Hibiki some special powers, but Hibiki declines the offer, saying she has plenty of friends and a smooth life. The goddess asks if she wants to spend her life with friends who she doesn't have a deep connection with. Hibiki asks what the goddess means. The goddess explains that the world Hibiki is in right now is limited and she probably longs for a friend who will always support her and a life worth taking risks for. This intrigues Hibiki, and the goddess promises to bless her with powerful magic, increased physical strength, charismatic leadership, and a divine item. She gives Hibiki a silver belt and sends her to Limia Kingdom, expressing high hopes for her. Meanwhile, in Limia Kingdom, the king receives a prophecy from the goddess about the descendants of a hero, and he believes it's a chance to finally free the kingdom from the torment of the demons. Hibiki is suddenly teleported to a kingdom where many people have gathered to welcome her. The goddess introduces her as the hero and asks everyone to treat her well. Hibiki finds it hard to believe that she's in another world, and she's not sure if this is all the goddess has to say. Meanwhile, Makoto is still wandering in the wastelands, and there's no one to welcome him. Days after Hibiki's arrival, she looks at a map of the continent that resembles Japan. She learns that the demons were pushed into a barren land by the goddess's people, but they've been expanding their territory for a decade. This expansion led to the downfall of the Kingdom of Elshin, and now the Limea Kingdom has allied with the Gratonia Empire to form a last line of defense. Hibiki remembers that the officials didn't like it when she mentioned there's another hero in the Gratonia Empire. She understands that neighboring countries might not be friendly, and she prepares for the worst after the war with the demons ends. She also recalls that the belt the goddess gave her has a wolf spirit inside, which surprises her. Tomorrow, she has to choose her party members from a group of mercenaries. Based on the king's recommendations, the confirmed members are the court magician Woody and a rising star among the knights named Norst. Hibiki starts to suspect favoritism in the selection of her party members. The next day, during the recruitment process, a girl named Naval notices Hibiki and thinks she doesn't seem like a battle-hardened warrior. Naval tries to leave, but the court magician Woody stops her, questioning her decision. 
Navel expresses her disinterest in being a bodyguard for an elite student and just wants to kill demons. She attempts to leave again, but Hibiki stops her. Hibiki recognizes Navel as one of the strongest fighters present and asks her to join her party. She wants Navel to train her in swordplay and be her battle partner, promising they'll kill many demons together on the front lines. Navel hesitates, but Hibiki whispers to her that she knows Navel desires to slay demons, and by joining her, she'll have plenty of opportunities on the front lines. Hibiki assures Navel won't get bored and mentions it's better than rejecting her offer and potentially not being allowed to stay in the country. Navel accepts Hibiki's offer. A knight named Norse finds Hibiki beautiful and wants to find a way to stay close to her. Meanwhile, Makoto is shown fighting a dragon that becomes enamored with him. The scene shifts to the Linnea Kingdom's border, where Hibiki and her party are supposed to pick up a priestess from the Laurel Commonwealth. They notice the priestess's carriage in trouble, surrounded by kobolds, creatures that grow stronger by consuming mana. Ruddy, a member of Hibiki's party, is impressed by the priestess's ability to fend off the kobolds with her shield. Navel notices four kobolds and suggests they each take one out quickly to prevent them from summoning reinforcements with a screen. Navel asks Hibiki if she'll be okay since she hasn't slain a monster before, and Hibiki assures them she will. They attack kobolds, managing to defeat one. However, when Hibiki hesitates to deliver a fatal blow, the kobold pleads for mercy, summoning reinforcements with its screams. More kobolds arrive, overwhelming the party and nearly breaking the priestess's barrier. Feeling responsible, Hibiki becomes enraged and slays the kobolds, leading the party to defeat the rest. Despite the victory, Hibiki is distraught over the carnage caused. Navel praises her for a first attempt, and the priestess, Chia, thanks her for saving them. Chia surprises everyone by asking to join the hero's party. Attempting to dissuade her, the party is shocked when Chia cuts her hair, explaining it's to prevent her people from thinking she was harmed by Limia's residence. Hibiki's party members are taken aback by Chia's seemingly threatening gesture. Chia clarifies her goal to end the war, and Hibiki finds her approach contradictory. Hibiki mentions Chia shouldn't have cut her beautiful hair, but Chia insists it would hinder her in battle. When Haki and Navel suggest cutting their hair as well, Chia reassures them they don't need to, as they are already strong. The scene shifts to him playing video games at home, still feeling annoyed about earlier events, and he throws his game away. While lying down, he spots an Ice Guy novel nearby, thinking that having special powers in another world might make him brave. The goddess summons him to her world, introducing herself and explaining that monsters threaten her realm. She asks him to become a hero and save her world. Assuring him not to worry, the goddess mentions sending another person with similar powers. Tomoki inquires about the powers he will receive, and the goddess describes a body capable of fighting monsters, magical abilities surpassing demons, a compelling devil eye, and silver boots granting flight and fatigue relief. Tomoki sees these as cheat skills, almost like a dream, and asks if there's more. The goddess adds the ability to have an undying body at night, but this power only works when the moon is out. Tomoki wants the goddess to change his appearance, and she agrees. She transforms his look and sends him to the Gratinia Empire. Princess Lily Flank Gratinia welcomes him, introducing herself as the second princess. Tomoki also introduces himself, and Lily suggests moving to a better location for a conversation. On the way, a female knight named Genibia asks Lily about a prophecy, and Lily introduces Tomoki. Tomoki comments on Genibia's role as a female knight, unintentionally using his devil eye on her. This causes Genibia to be attracted to him, overlooking his rudeness. Lily notices this and takes Tomoki for level and magical item compatibility tests. After the tests, Tomoki feels tired, and Lily promises to send someone to show him around the castle at night. She advises him to rest, and later, Lily consults a doctor about Tomoki's results. The doctor reveals Tomoki has a magical eye-enhancing charm effects, prompting Lily to seek help in neutralizing its impact on her and the royal family. She urges the doctor to keep this information confidential, expressing her dislike for the hero's innocent appearance. Tomoki then asks Lily what she thought about him when she first saw him. Lily replies that she knew he was the hero destined to lead them to greatness, praising him as a great hero admired by everyone. She expresses her admiration by kissing him, and the two spend the night together. Lily reflects that she is willing to sacrifice anything to eradicate the demons, driven by her mother's belief in the wayward goddess. Meanwhile, during these events, Makoto enters into a contract with the Black Spider. Later, Tomoki returns to the palace after a battle, and Lily praises his performance. They plan to reclaim Fort Stellar from the demons and form an alliance with Linnea for their next battle. Tomoki expresses his loyalty to Lily, but her smile suggests hidden motives. The story shifts to Hibiki and her party at an army camp near Fort Stellar. 
They learn about an upcoming ball, which Hibiki believes will also involve discussions about the strategy to retake the fort. Mabel explains that the ball is meant to boost the army's morale, and she mentions that the hero from Gratonia is seeking the goddess's blessing, which could give humans an advantage in battles against demi-humans or demons. Hibiki appears concerned, and Naval asks if she's nervous about meeting Gratonia's hero. Hibiki admits that meeting the other hero, who is around her age and from her world, is one of her worries. Later, they meet Princess Lily and Tomoki, who explain the battle plan. Lily mentions that while they received supplies and reinforcements from King Ian, the support from Laurel is less than expected, likely due to the situation with Chia. However, she assures them that their combat strength is five times that of the demons, and with the goddess's blessing, victory should be assured. Hibiki asks why the battle is set for nighttime, and Tomoki explains that they excel in night battles, even though Hibiki's party lacks experience in them. Tomoki believes that the goddess's blessing will boost their strength and weaken the demons. He emphasizes the importance of quickly reclaiming the fort to earn the goddess's praise and suggests they relax and chat. Hibiki then asks Tomoki if they've met in the real world, and he confirms they haven't. Hibiki remembers that Tomoki shares the same name as a famous model her friends like, and Tomoki clarifies that he has no connection to that person. Hibiki apologizes for the mistake, and Tomoki insists he's not upset. He then asks Hibiki about her level, and she mentions it's 430. Tomoki shares that his level is 603, and Hibiki wonders why he's suddenly boasting about it. She comments on his hard work, and Tomoki suggests she call him Mr. Tomoki instead of using his first name. Hibiki agrees, thinking it's a bit strange considering he encouraged them to be relaxed and chat. Tomoki decides he'll use her first name since he's not good with honorifics. Later, Hibiki gazes at the sky, and Naval asks what's on her mind. Hibiki expresses her concern that they might be in over their heads. Naval asks Hibiki why she came to this world, and Hibiki explains that in her previous world, she was born into a privileged family where success came easily. Naval acknowledges that Hibiki gives off that vibe but is surprised that she's now on the battlefield. Hibiki mentions her emotional reaction when she couldn't bring herself to kill the cobble and says it was the first time she faced defeat and had to trust someone else with her life. She acknowledges that they'll encounter even greater challenges and surprises, but has no regrets about coming to this world. They decide to rest for the night as they have a battle ahead. The scene shifts to Tomoki and the soldiers praying for the goddess's blessing the next night. After that, the demon army's commander, Rona, receives information about the movements of Linian and Gratonia troops. She notes that they have received the goddess's blessing and are advancing as expected. Rona prepares to enter the battle and instructs a soldier to inform Io about their plans. The human army is marching forward, and Woody warns his party to watch out for enemy traps in this dangerous terrain. They've lost many knights and mages along this route before. Suddenly, the demon army attacks. Tomoki orders his troops to engage in combat, and they start fighting the demon soldiers. Most of the demons are defeated quite easily, and Hibiki notices that their enemies seem weaker than expected. She recalls being told it was impossible to reach the fort through this path and asks Chai to set up a protective barrier. Woody also casts a levitation spell for faster movement as a precaution. The human army manages to reach the fort's gates and opens them. Rona, the demon army's commander, notices the two heroes are in range and decides it's time to test their strengths. She uses a magic array to make the entire human army fall into a giant pitfall. However, Hibiki's party survives due to Woody's earlier levitation spell. Tomoki also survives thanks to his flying boots, and he counters Rona's magic attack with his divine lance attack. Tomoki is relieved to see his party members are okay, as Yukonatsu created replicas of his boots for them. Tomoki then summons the dragon Nagi and attacks the fort while riding it. Rona realizes the dragon's firepower is formidable but knows they need more to capture the fort. Tomoki lands inside the fort and asks more and Yukonatsu for support while charging ahead with Genibia. They encounter Io, and Tomoki attacks him without introducing himself. Io comments on the rudeness of attacking without proper introductions, but Tomoki says manners don't matter in battle, and strikes again, damaging one of Io's arms. Hibiki joins the fight, introducing herself, and Io reveals himself as the general of the Demon Lord's Third Legion. Io astonishes them by instantly regenerating his lost arm. He then uses a ring to nullify the goddess's blessing on the heroes, weakening both of them. Tomoki realizes that he could die from damage in his current state. He suggests they retreat, leaving Hibiki concerned that he might leave her to fight alone. The scene shifts to Mio and Tamo embarking on their own journeys. Mio expresses a wish to talk to Makoto. Tamo speculates if Mio intends to surprise him with her culinary discovery. Mio reveals her destination, a port town called Kirin, 
where she plans to find seaweed and kelp for the Japanese-style cooking Makoto enjoys. Mia suggests that Tamo is heading to investigate the location where Makoto fought the dragon slayer. Tamo confirms, mentioning a giant lake that appeared after the fight, prompting her curiosity. Mio feels lonely, but Tamo assures her it won't last long. She shares news from Shiki that Makoto has reached the town of Roskar and should return to the Demiplane once settled. The narrative then shifts to Makoto and Shiki in Roskar, where they notice various stores and products. They witness a girl being bullied, and Makoto, concerned, tries to intervene. However, his inability to communicate with humans hinders his efforts as the bullies don't notice him. Makoto urges Shiki to intervene. The bullies mock them for their academy uniforms. Makoto thinks Mio and Tamo might suggest killing them, but Shiki wouldn't. The guys insult Makoto and Shiki, triggering a request to convince them to leave. Shiki asks if he can kill them, but Makoto rejects violence. Shiki proposes convincing them to leave, warning them he'll kill if they don't. The bullies use wind magic to levitate, surprised that Makoto doesn't attack. Shiki counters with earth magic, causing them to float. Makoto, using a counterspell, dispels the magic, leaving them levitating. Makoto advises the girl to leave if she's unharmed, but she claims she didn't ask for help. Makoto assures her no favors are owed. Learning she works at the Five Irons restaurant, she invites Makoto to try their hot pots to repay his kindness. Makoto plans to visit later. Meanwhile, the bullies remain levitating, as Shiki suggests leaving them until they run out of mana. Makoto urges Shiki to save the bullies using his magic. Shiki complies but makes them fall, prompting the bullies to run away and threaten revenge. Makoto believes Shiki needs to mature and handle situations better. Shiki points out that stopping such incidents is difficult, advising against involvement. Although Makoto agrees, he's troubled by the girl's distressed expression. Shiki apologizes for his previous remarks, and Makoto suggests focusing on finding a way into the academy for now. With the entrance exam approaching in three days, Makoto plans to take it to be recognized as a local resident. Shiki inquires if Makoto will take the exam, and Makoto explains that passing it is essential for him to be acknowledged and obtain a permit for setting up a store in the town. Shiki reveals to Makoto that he won't be taking the entrance exam, but instead the lecturer qualification exam, which sparks Makoto's curiosity about the role. Shiki clarifies that passing this exam would make Makoto eligible to become a teacher. Examining the documents from Rembrandt, Shiki asserts that it is indeed the lecturer qualification exam. Meanwhile, Rembrandt speculates that Makoto has likely arrived in Rosgard. He notices Morris struggling with small writings and considers the possibility of prisbiopia, an age-related vision issue. Morris argues that he can read familiar texts without any issues. Rembrandt suggests getting Morris prescription glasses to avoid mistakes in handling documents. The story transitions to the day of the lecturer qualification examination and Makoto reflects on how he might have avoided it if Rembrandt hadn't recommended him. As a staff member begins explaining the rules to Makoto, he interrupts to ask about other job opportunities at the academy. The staff member becomes annoyed at Makoto's question and scolds him, revealing that others have made similar inquiries before. Shiki, angered by the staff member's behavior, drains some of his life force. Makoto intervenes to prevent further escalation and apologizes on behalf of Shiki. A woman arrives, apologizing for the staff member's behavior and emphasizing that negative comments about examinees are strictly forbidden. She acknowledges that Makoto's inquiry might not have been well-timed but assures him that it was a mistake on their part. She proceeds to check Makoto's documents and notices his proficiency in combat techniques. Considering his letter of recommendation from Rembrandt Trading Company, she asks Makoto whether he prefers the written or practical exam. Shiki, making the choice for Makoto, opts for the practical-only exam which is known to be the most challenging. The woman explains that only a few people have passed this rigorous exam, leaving Makoto surprised by the difficulty level. The scene sets the stage for Makoto's challenging examination and his quest to become a teacher at the academy. The story shifts to the examiner explaining the rules of the three-day exam. Each examinee is given two items, a feather for returning to the exam venue and a bell for forfeiting. They are prohibited from battling each other, though they may encounter monsters in the area. To pass, they must collect three high-speed balls within three days and bring them back to the academy. The examiner emphasizes that examinees can borrow any weapon but must prepare their own food. Makoto finds the task seemingly simple, with details in the manual provided. The scene transitions to Makoto at the exam venue, where he uses Perception Kai to observe abundant resources compared to his initial summoning location. Noticing other examinees far away, Makoto discovers a red ball. Consulting the manual, he learns that balls stop moving after taking enough damage, with specific attack methods designated. 
The red ball, vulnerable to physical damage, breaks when Makoto punches it, surprising him. He then spots a yellow ball, susceptible to magical attacks. Despite using a bird to attack, the yellow ball also breaks. Makoto finally notices a blue ball, which can only be damaged by ranged attacks. Using a bow, he damages the blue ball, only to witness it break as well. Makoto reflects on the failed attempts to damage the high-speed balls, considering whether his boosting spell might be the cause. Even after undoing the spell, the balls continue to break upon contact, leaving him without progress on the first day. Frustrated, he sets up a barrier causing pain to deter monsters, and goes to sleep. The next day, Makoto discovers defeated monsters outside the barrier, indicating others in the vicinity. After dealing with the monsters, he checks on the remaining examine and notices the absence of the elf, contemplating if they have already finished. Trying to capture a blue ball, Makoto experiments with hitting it using only the fletching of an arrow. Though successful, the ball teleports, requiring Makoto to locate and hit it again to immobilize it. Elated to finally secure one of the balls, he observes the disappearance of another examinee, pondering whether they passed or dropped out. Spotting a yellow ball, Makoto weakens himself using his kai and fires the weakest arrow he can manage. This method successfully stops the yellow ball from moving, and Makoto believes he can make progress with one day remaining. After eating, he notices a new presence in the area. The following morning, Makoto spots a suspicious-looking person among the monsters affected by his barrier. The stranger, an assassin, launches an attack using knives. Makoto successfully blocks the assault, prompting the assassin to employ a spell to conceal himself. Despite the hidden presence, Makoto's kai allows him to sense the assassin's location. Attempting to create distance, Makoto finds himself hindered by the assassin, who grabs his clothes and attempts another knife attack. In response, Makoto breaks the knife with his bare hands, causing the assassin to retreat. Makoto realizes the knife was coated with poison and questions the assassin's motives, asking if he is targeting the examinees. The assassin admits to his intentions, revealing that the others have already departed. Although unenthusiastic about the job, the assassin insists Makoto must pay for breaking his knife. He claims Makoto will succumb to the fast-acting poison coating the weapon in seconds. Surprisingly, nothing happens to Makoto, leading the assassin to suspect he neutralized the poison. Makoto proposes to share his antidote knowledge if the assassin discloses information about the person who hired him. The assassin, however, explains he doesn't know the client, as he accepted the job through the assassin's guild. Deciding not to press further, Makoto reveals that he has temporarily paralyzed the assassin from the neck down. Informing the paralyzed assassin of his immunity to poisons, Makoto kicks him away. As the day nears its end, Makoto faces the challenge of capturing a red ball, realizing that using pure physical strength is difficult due to his body constantly emitting mana. However, he recalls that the non-magical knife he acquired for cooking might be the key. Using the knife, he successfully captures a red ball. Returning to the exam hall, Makoto discovers that the others have already arrived. Displaying the balls to the examiner, he astonishes the official by presenting three balls of different colors. The examiner expresses disbelief as most individuals usually gather three balls of the color susceptible to their best attack. Makoto's unique approach makes him the first to pass the exam in this unconventional manner. In the aftermath, Makoto informs Shiki about being hired as a temporary instructor. While awaiting the next steps in the process, he suggests they visit the hot pot restaurant. Shiki eagerly anticipates the visit. The scene shifts to the examiner venting his frustrations in a bar, revealing that the exam was intended to be nearly impossible to pass this time. However, Makoto's unexpected success in gathering three balls of different colors surprises both the examiner and a curious girl at the bar. The examiner laments the unintended outcome, while the girl finds the situation intriguing. Makoto's innovative approach to the exam showcases his adaptability and resourcefulness, leading to a surprising and successful outcome. The next scene shows Makoto getting permission to open a new store in Rosvar. We learn that he recently got a notice about being officially hired as a lecturer. Shiki comments on how sudden the notice was, and Makoto tells him they need to register this afternoon. Afterward, they head to the Five Irons. Luria greets them warmly and thanks them for being regular customers. She asks if they're having hot pot today, and Shiki confirms. Makoto orders a chicken hot pot for himself surprising Luria as most people usually share one. Makoto explains they've been coming for five days, and Shiki loves the hot pot here. Meanwhile, a student named Ilingen watches them, curious about their frequent visits. Another student approaches Ilingen, saying she needs to talk to him about something. The scene shifts to Luria bringing Makoto's group their hot pots. Makoto notes that Shiki loves the creamy hot pot, which Makoto himself isn't a fan of. 
Luria then asks Makoto if he's going to teach at the academy. She starts to mention that she knows someone there, but she's called away by another waitress before she can finish. Later, we see Makoto at the academy, where a staff member explains the rules he needs to follow. She tells him that running his business won't be a problem as long as he doesn't handle money in school. Teachers earn wages based on the number of students they have, getting 10 silver coins per student. As a part-time teacher, Makoto can have up to 30 students, and his first lesson is scheduled for next week. Makoto agrees and says he wants to start with just 10 students to focus on quality teaching. The staff member is surprised because most teachers try to take as many students as possible. Makoto explains he wants to prioritize quality over quantity. Then, a full-time lecturer named Blight arrives and talks to Makoto. Blight learns that Makoto wants to teach practical skills, so he promises to send 10 interested students to Makoto's class. Makoto thanks him, and Blight mentions that this year's students are exceptional, with some capable of using levitation spells and telepathy. Makoto recalls the students from earlier and wonders if they're considered outstanding. Blight mentions hearing about Makoto's strength and looks forward to seeing him in action. The scene shifts to Makoto in the library, where the librarian asks if she can assist him. Makoto explains he's searching for materials for his class as his assistant applies for a permit. He asks for books on magic spells, but the librarian suggests they might be too basic for him. Makoto is surprised when the librarian knows his name, but she says it's her job to know. Makoto finds it unbelievable since there are many lecturers in the academy. The librarian reveals she heard about him during a dinner with the examiner and mentions Luria from the Five Irons as her sister. She talks about customers who always order two hot pots, which Makoto realizes is likely the person Luria mentioned. The librarian introduces herself as Eva, but Makoto senses something off about her smile, reminiscent of Mio. The scene shifts to Mio in the port town of Kirin, where she's learning how to chop vegetables from a girl named Beretta. Beretta teaches her the basics, demonstrating how to peel a radish using a technique called Katsuramuki. Mio is surprised by her skill and wonders if this method has applications beyond cooking. A week passes, and we see students heading to attend Makoto's class. They're curious about their new teacher, but also a bit apprehensive. They're used to Professor Blight's classes, where just showing up was usually enough. Makoto, using his investigative ability, overhears their conversation and feels underestimated by them. Shiki suggests Makoto should appear strict to earn their respect, as being too nice might make them look down on him. Makoto agrees and prepares to meet his students. When they arrive, Shiki and Makoto introduce themselves, but the students seem unimpressed, likening Makoto's appearance to that of a cobble. Makoto informs them that he'll give them a detailed lesson focused on magic and asks a student which elements they can control. The student replies that they're good with wind and knows a bit of earth and fire magic. Makoto asks another student the same question, and she says she can use fire and wind magic. Then, Makoto inquires how many of them can master multiple elements equally well. The students remain quiet, and Makoto decides to follow Tamo's approach. He tells them he now understands their strengths and emphasizes that they'll stay average unless they improve. One of the girls feels he's being too harsh, arguing they were accepted into the academy because they're qualified. Makoto responds that he's just stating facts. Another student adds that in magic, it's common to choose one element to master. Makoto explains that relying on just one element in battle could be dangerous if the enemy figures it out, so it's important to be skilled in multiple elements. The students find this idea simple but question if Makoto can do it himself. Makoto decides to demonstrate by having a mock battle with Shiki. As they prepare, the students notice Makoto doesn't emit any magic energy, while Shiki's staff radiates immense power. Shiki swiftly attacks Makoto with his staff, but Makoto defends himself using a barrier. Through telepathy, Makoto communicates with Shiki, acknowledging his progress, credited to training from Mio and Tamo. Makoto then counterattacks with a fire spell. Shiki defends himself with a barrier, and then tries to attack Makoto with an earth spell, but Makoto avoids it and destroys the spell with a fire arrow. The students are amazed by their skills. Makoto combines fire and water to attack Shiki, but Shiki blocks it, crediting his special staff made by elder dwarves. Makoto suggests ending the battle soon, and they both prepare for their final moves. The students are surprised as it's the first time they've seen Makoto and Shiki chant spells. They anticipate the power of their spells, noticing Makoto's ability to speak. The spells collide, and when the dust settles, Shiki is defeated. Makoto worries that the students might quit his class after witnessing their strength. He ends the session, leaving the decision to the students. Meanwhile, Shiki tends to a girl injured during the battle, using some effective ointment. The girl is amazed by its quick healing, assuming it must be expensive. 
While some girls consider quitting, the boys are excited and fearful, thinking they could become stronger under Makoto's guidance. Shiki reassures the girl that they have plenty of the ointment in their shop, calming her worries. Impressed by his appearance, the girl is captivated by him. Shiki then departs, leaving Makoto to ponder if anyone will remain for his next class. Shiki predicts that at least half of the students will stay. Makoto reflects on his own expression, realizing he shouldn't mimic Tamo too closely. Meanwhile, Tamo is near the Star Lake, conversing with a wounded soldier who witnessed the war between demons and humans. She learns that the lake formed during that battle is now known as Star Lake. Delving into the man's memory, Tamo discovers that the lake was created by one of Makoto's attacks. She finds amusement in Makoto's actions, marveling at how he never fails to surprise her. The scene shifts to Makoto's next class, where he notices that out of the initial 10 students, only 5 remain. One student, Jean Rowan, introduces himself as aspiring to become a swordsman, and Makoto notes his high performance in practical tests. Another student, Izumo Kiwesuke, introduces himself as aspiring to become a mage. Makoto infers from his Japanese-sounding name that he is likely from the Laurel Commonwealth. Abelia Hopleys introduces herself next, prompting Makoto to recall another Hopleys student from the school, known to be the child of a prominent aristocrat in Limia. Dina Severus introduces himself as a married individual, sharing that his wife is currently on maternity leave due to imminent childbirth. The last student, Mitra Kaspar, mentions being born and raised in Rosgar, with both parents serving as clerics. Izumo then questions Makoto about his use of magic for communication, noting that Makoto had chanted a spell the day before. Makoto explains that he can't speak the common language for a particular reason, then begins the class. He inquires about the effects of mana depletion on the body. The students respond, noting that when half of the mana is used up, both mental and physical exhaustion occur. At 20%, the body becomes immobile. Complete depletion results in vomiting, confusion, and loss of consciousness, and if it goes beyond the limit, it could be fatal. Dina recalls learning this in elementary school. Makoto emphasizes the importance of understanding their limits through actual combat, assuring them of the availability of medicines to replenish mana and stamina. The scene shifts to the students exhausted after sparring with Makoto, with only Jean and Mitra remaining standing. Mitra uses his healing magic to support Jean, who attempts to attack Makoto but is swiftly defeated. After everyone is down, Makoto distributes stamina and magic potions, emphasizing the necessity of experiencing one's limits first he instructs them to reflect on their actions and submit a report. The scene changes to Ilungan winning a mock battle. He recalls receiving pills from a girl at the academy, explaining they enhance physical and magical ability, part of the academy's ongoing development. The scene shifts to Ilungan walking down the academy hallway with the pills. He spots Makoto and wonders why he's there, pondering if Makoto is a lecturer. Then, the scene changes to Makoto reviewing the students' reports. He reflects on their potential, noting Jean's impressive stamina and leadership qualities. Shiki acknowledges Makoto's keen observations, and Makoto admits he's still adjusting to teaching but is committed to doing his best. Meanwhile, Blight is frustrated that the Assassin Guild failed to eliminate Makoto. The Assassin explains Makoto's exceptional strength, even breaking his knife made from a great dragon scale. Blight dismisses the excuses and urges the Assassin to finish off Makoto quickly. It's been two weeks since Makoto became a lecturer and a new store outside of Seagate has opened. We see Makoto has brought the Ogre sisters, Eris and Aqua, to work at the store. He shows them the merchandise and explains that the store will be open until midnight to help build its reputation. The sisters are frightened at the thought of working until that late, but Makoto reassures them. He explains they'll work in shifts, take breaks, receive a food allowance, and have a supportive manager like Shiki. Makoto mentions that since it's a new store, it shouldn't be too busy, making it easier to manage than the one in Seijie. The sisters find this reassuring, but Makoto is unsure if they can handle the store alone. Later, the scene shifts to Makoto in the academy's library, looking exhausted. He reflects on his successful classes and business ventures, but he's troubled by girls asking to marry him for his money, wanting to be his third wife to avoid responsibilities. Makoto questions if what these girls propose can even be called marriage as he gazes at a drawing of his parents. Eva inquires about the people in the drawing and Makoto describes them as kind individuals who looked after him, feeling a strong connection to them. Reflecting on his past, he finds it odd how people here perceive marriage. Eva elaborates that many students come from families where marriages are strategic alliances. Makoto finds it surprising that these young people are already considering marriage. Eva compliments Makoto's innocence. Makoto compares his current situation with the genuine friendships he had with Tamo and Mio, 
feeling they were better than these materialistic relationships. The scene shifts to Tamo near the Star Lake, where Lime informs her about a past battle between someone and Waterfall Lake and near Stellar Fort, likely Sophia. He wonders if Tamo found any clues about the ring sealing the goddess's power. Tamo admits she didn't find anything about the ring but did discover who created the Star Lake. Lime remarks that it's evident since their young master is the only one with such capability. Tamo then notices they are being followed, and someone is outside their camp. Curious, Tamo inquires about the intruder's identity, and they claim to be a group of travelers seeking rare and quality weapons. Tamo welcomes them inside, revealing the travelers as Tomoki, Lily, and Mara. Introducing herself, Tamo explains their role as guards for the Kusanoa Company at the border. Tomoki admires Tamo's impressive weapon collection and her strength, prompting him to ask her age. Tamo tactfully suggests it's impolite to inquire about a lady's age before introducing oneself. The travelers then introduce themselves, leading Lime to deduce they are the hero and second princess of Gratini. Tamo questions their purpose in visiting, considering their knightly and aristocratic demeanor from another kingdom. Lily reveals they're here to investigate the sudden appearance of a lake. Tomoki requests to examine Tamo's katana, but when he tries to draw it, he finds it impossible. Tamo explains that a spell restricts anyone else from unsheathing it except her. Tomoki insists it's impossible, claiming he can wield any weapon in the world, but Tamo warns him not to handle it roughly. Taking back the katana, Tamo displays its appearance to Tomoki, who shows interest. Surprised by its quality, Tomoki and his companions admire it. However, Tamo indicates they're busy and should depart. Lily expresses interest in buying the katana, but Tamo reiterates that only she can use it. Lily then reveals their true purpose, asking for Tamo's assistance for the world's sake. Tamo suspects they have ulterior motives, perhaps aiming to replicate the weapon for their own agenda. Firmly, she refuses to sell her katana, signaling the end of their discussion. Tomoki then uses his special eye power online, trying to persuade Tamo to let him have her katana. However, Tamo firmly tells him to be quiet, noticing Lime's unusual behavior. Tomoki then attempts to use his power on Tamo herself, asking her to join their mission to save the world, but his eye has no effect on her. Tamo, annoyed, tells him to stop giving her that creepy stare, and she questions if Tomoki is a pervert for persistently bothering her. Disappointed with Tomoki's behavior, she rejects his offer, stating her unwavering loyalty to her master. Surprised that his power didn't work on her, Mora asks if Tamo is a dragon. Tamo clarifies that she is not an ordinary dragon, possessing immense strength and presence. Lily speculates if she might be the formidable waterfall Leica, known as the strongest dragon in the region. Tamo clarifies that she is not Leica, surprising Lily, who can't believe Tamo read her mind. Mora attempts to use her dragon summoner powers to control Tamo, but it fails. Tamo counters with her own aura, dispelling Mora's powers. This also breaks the effect of Tomoki's magic eye on Lime leaving Tomoki puzzled as to why he wanted to give his katana to someone like Lime. Angered by Tamo's rejection, Tomoki attacks Lime. Tamo dismisses Tomoki's behavior as childish and calls him a hopeless scoundrel. She then vanishes into mist, suggesting they forget the encounter ever happened. She warns against any foolish plans, hinting that the hero from the Empire will meet his demise if they continue. With that, Tamo disappears with the mist. Tomoki admires Tamo's unique character and desires to make her his own. Meanwhile, Tamo and Lime reflect on the absurdity of Lime almost giving away his treasured katana to Tomoki. Tamo then offers Lime the opportunity to become her servant, and Lime agrees without hesitation. He expresses his happiness at the chance to grow stronger at his own pace. He fears regretting his lack of strength when it's most needed, so he eagerly begins his training with Tamo. Meanwhile, Mio is gathering seaweed and finds it surprisingly delicious and safe to eat. Suddenly, Hibiki's wolf attacks her, causing Mio to fall into the sea and soak her kimono. Angered, Mio tries to retaliate against the wolf, but Hibiki intervenes, apologizing for her pet's actions and ensuring Mio's safety. Mio observes Hibiki's concern for her well-being over her own life. Hibiki promises to discipline her pet, returning it to its place at her obai. Mio ponders whether Hibiki might be a spirit. Hibiki explains that the creature was a guardian beast of sorts, which reminds Mio of Makoto due to her peculiar smile. Concerned, Hibiki asks if Mio is alright to which Mio reassures her, mentioning that the wolf only left some marks on her kimono. Wanting to make amends, Hibiki asks if there's anything she can do to help. Mio suggests that Hibiki assist her in selecting the best pieces of seaweed from the pot. Mio notices Hibiki's knowledge of differentiating between seaweed and kelp, and Hibiki mentions they can make excellent miso soup with them. Excited at the prospect of cooking together, Mio looks forward to preparing the dish. 
Two days later, Mio travels with the hero's party and learns they're headed to Sige to acquire weapons. During the journey, Mio and Hibiki discuss cooking. Woody observes that while Hibiki may seem tough on the outside, she carries deep emotional scars. Despite hiding her identity during her travels in hopes of healing, Woody doubts it will be easy for her to find peace. Mio asks Hibiki's party if they're strong, and Hibiki mentions she's a decent fighter. Feeling confident in their ability, Mio decides to let them handle the rare creature approaching them. Suddenly, a giant mantis-like monster appears. Hibiki's party attempts to fight it, but Mio observes that they lack proper equipment despite their skill. Norst wonders why they encountered the monster before resupplying in Sige, and feels he must support Hibiki in Naval's absence. He confronts the mantis but gets injured in the process, leading Hibiki to recall Naval's death, which frightens her. Seeking Mio's aid, she asks for help. Mio swiftly defeats the mantis, surprising everyone. Concerned for Norst, Mio checks on him. Though injured, his wounds aren't life-threatening. However, the mantis, still alive, launches a surprise attack on Mio, ruining her kimono. Enraged, Mio destroys the monsters. Witnessing Mio's power, Hibiki's party is amazed. Mio hopes her kimono can be repaired. As she releases a powerful attack, the miasma knocks out Hibiki and her party. The wolf emerges to protect Hibiki. Feeling a sense of familiarity, Mio reassures the wolf that she means no harm. The wolf calms down, sensing Mio's changed intentions. The scene shifts to Hibiki recalling memories of Naval, and she awakens in an inn. Finding a note from Mio, she learns that Mio brought them to Sige and advises them to visit the Kusanoha Trading Company. Later, Hibiki and her group arrive at the Kusanoha Trading Company, where they meet Mio. Hibiki asks about her kimono, and Mio assures her it will be fixed. Hibiki wonders if Mio brought them there to scold her for facing the monster alone, but Mio clarifies that she invited them to cook together. Mio suggests Hibiki can repay her by spending time cooking with her, surprising Hibiki with the simple request. Woody informs Mio they came to Seagate for new equipment and training but are short on time. Mio points out that if they struggled against the monster, heading to the wastelands would be futile. Despite this, Hibiki insists on getting stronger. Baron suggests that he'll craft the gear they need for the wastelands, with payment to follow later. He plans to spend the next three days making the equipment while they train, and during that time, he wants them to teach Mio how to cook. Mio expresses concern that new gear won't ensure their survival, emphasizing that if they perish, she won't be able to learn to cook the soup, which surprises Hibiki. Baron proposes that Toa and her group accompany them for added support, which Mio finds agreeable. Hibiki appreciates the offer. The scene shifts to Mio cooking a few days later, showing improvement in peeling vegetables and assessing ingredients, though her sense of taste remains lacking. Hibiki notes that Mio can handle unappetizing food but is sensitive to tasty dishes. She suggests that if Mio can discern between them, there's hope for improvement, and they should focus on mastering this skill. The scene changes to Makoto and Shiki enjoying a hot pot meal together. Shiki brings up that Tamo has requested their return to the demiplane, as she has important news to share with Makoto. Makoto reflects on how they've mainly been communicating through telepathy lately. Shiki suggests they go back since the forest ogres can manage the shop in their absence. Although Makoto feels a bit concerned, he decides to trust Shiki's judgment and agrees to return to the demiplane. This bring an end to our episode. If you enjoyed it then don't forget to like, share and subscribe our channel for more anime recaps. Makoto notices that the demiplane feels unusually hot, and Shiki informs him that the weather patterns have become more erratic. Confused by the changes, Makoto realizes that his once cozy demiplane now feels different. However, he finds solace in the completion of his house. Inside, Makoto is warmly greeted by the residents, including Mio and Tamo. He expresses his gratitude for their hard work and raises a toast to them. They all share a meal together, and Emma tells Makoto how much they missed him, encouraging him to visit more often. Neo serves Makoto some soup, which he enjoys, bringing tears of joy to Neo's eyes. Tamo reveals that Neo had been on a journey to improve her cooking skills and prepared all the food for the party. Makoto praises Neo's efforts, and Mio expresses her newfound appreciation for cooking, promising to make even better dishes next time before leaving for Seije. Emma explains that she's learning to cook from an adventurer in Seije, while Tamo informs Makoto that they have a meeting scheduled later and advises him to rest until then. The scene transitions to Makoto having a meeting with Tamo and Mio, during which Tamo reveals her investigation into the area where Makoto fought the Dragon Slayer. She mentions encountering the hero's party, led by a young man named Tomoki Iwahashi, who appeared to be around Makoto's age. Makoto asks Tamo what she thinks of him, and she admits she had a bad impression. She saw him as a dishonest person who was overly focused on his power 
and desires. Tamo believes that after defeating the demons, Makoto might start a war with humans. She also mentions reading the princess's thoughts and learning about a weapon called a gun. Shiki believes the hero might have informed the princess about it. Makoto doesn't see guns as powerful as magic but acknowledges their potential for assassination and genocide. Tamo finds both magic and guns repulsive. She even considered killing the hero and princess without informing Makoto. Makoto advises against such drastic actions. Tamo admits she didn't gather useful information about the goddess's power or the dragon slayer. Makoto wonders if she discovered anything about him, but Tamo found nothing unusual. All she knows is that someone shot an arrow during the battle, creating a lake. Makoto wonders if the unusual weather was caused by the goddess, but Tamo explains that survivors referred to the culprit as a devil. However, Makoto doesn't realize they're talking about him. He suggests they share information now, and Tamo mentions she already has an idea about the academy from Shiki. She heard Makoto is popular among girls and asks for details. Makoto thinks Shiki has already informed her but notes the unbearable heat. They step outside, and Makoto wonders about the irregular weather. He learns he's the reason behind it due to the misty door he set up outside. Makoto admits he sets up doors wherever he goes. Tamo explains the weather inside reflects the door's last location. Makoto finds the academy's weather pleasant, but Shiki suggests it's not solely due to the door's location but also influenced by the terrain. Tamo vows to continue investigating, leaving Makoto worried about traveling. The scene shifts to Mio discovering that Hibiki's party must return to Limia. Mio is saddened as she won't learn new dishes. Hibiki apologizes and mentions she has something important to attend to. Mio accepts the situation, understanding the harsh conditions of the wastelands as mentioned by Hibiki. She acknowledges they wouldn't have survived without her help in Baron's sword, expressing her gladness in assisting. Hibiki then invites Mio to join her, but Mio declines, preferring to stay with her young master. Despite Hibiki's attempts to persuade her, Mio remains steadfast, stating her loyalty lies solely with her young master. She wishes Hibiki a safe journey and suggests visiting Limia if she ever gets the chance, promising to teach her new recipe. Delighted by the offer, Mio and Hibiki part ways. The scene shifts to Makoto inspecting the fields in the demi plane. Emma informs him that their harvest has improved significantly due to Shiki's farming instruction. They now harvest produce every two weeks, thanks to their enhanced farmland. Makoto is impressed with the results of Shiki's technique and acknowledges its effectiveness. Shiki attributes the success to the knowledge he gained from Makoto. Makoto feels relieved that they no longer need to worry about food shortages and decides to focus on increasing the population of the demi plains as planned. Emma informs Makoto that they have already started the selection process for new inhabitants, with recommendations from Tamo, Mio, and Shiki. Makoto expresses his intention to interview the candidates. Additionally, Eld presents Makoto with a claw, explaining that Mio brought it after her kimono was damaged recently. Makoto is surprised to hear about the damage but relieved that Mio wasn't harmed. Eld explains that the material of the kimono was the issue and speculates that it may have come from a powerful monster. Makoto wonders if someone intentionally created such a monster. El reveals that he investigated and found evidence suggesting that a weak monster had consumed a wind spirit, which seemed unlikely. Shiki confesses that he created the monster as part of experiments conducted before meeting Makoto. He had captured and weakened several mid-level spirits, feeding them to monsters in hopes of producing favorable results, but ultimately abandoned the experiments. He apologizes to Makoto for his actions. Makoto questions if this was the only monster Shiki created, to which Shiki admits he made several. Eld suggests reporting the incident to Tamo and Neo for further action. Makoto suggests they should give Shiki a stern talking to for his mistake. Later, Makoto heads out to interview different species. Emma informs him that Tamo chose an unusual species. Mio relied on instincts, and Shiki selected based on ability. Makoto feels uneasy about the situation. Emma mentions that representatives from each race have been invited, as they hope to relocate. She advises Makoto to act as the master of the place, and not to use honorifics while referring to her. The first group, recommended by Shiki, consists of Winkin. Makoto welcomes them and they express gratitude for considering them as new residents. Makoto introduces himself, and the Winkin leader, Keiken, introduces his advisor, Shona. Emma wonders how long they plan to stay and they immediately descend. Makoto notices their large population, impressive given their remote living conditions. The Winkin inquire if they will be treated equally among current residents and given suitable jobs. Makoto confirms it's true, and the Winkin express relief that they won't need to fight for resources anymore. After passing the interview, Makoto meets the Gorgons recommended by Tamo. He requests them to remove their masks, but they hesitate due to their petrifying eyes. 
Makoto reassures them that he and Emma are protected. The Gorgons note they sense no magic from Makoto. Emma defends Makoto, and they comply, turning a table to stone. Makoto acknowledges the inconvenience caused by their eyes, which even affects their food. He observes they are all females, with no males. The Gorgons explain they reproduce by absorbing energy from males of other species. Makoto informs them they can't provide mates, and they'll have to find them on their own. The Gorgons agree but express concern about how other residents will handle their eyes. Makoto assures them not to worry, as he plans to make glasses that have the same effect as their mask. The Gorgons are thrilled but express concern about not being able to reverse petrification. Makoto demonstrates his ability to undo petrification and grants petrification resistance to objects. He assures them he can do this whenever needed, and the Gorgons are relieved they won't need their masks anymore. They request to stay, and Makoto agrees as long as they behave. He passes them as residents. Next, they meet the Al Elmer, recommended by Neo. Makoto mistakenly calls them fairies, but they correct him and boast about being superior to bugs like liches. Emma dislikes their attitude, but Makoto suggests using them for gathering information. Emma reiterates her opposition, warning of the potential disaster of allowing the Al Elmera into the Demiplane. She urges Makoto to take the interview seriously, emphasizing its importance for the Demiplane's future. She suggests that if the Al Elmer are as powerful as they claim, they should handle the Lick Pack themselves. The Yal Elmer insult Emma, calling her a pig, which angers her. Makoto rejects the Yal Elmer, and Tamo and Shiki inform him that two species have passed the interview. Shiki plans to create prototype glasses and contact lenses for the Gorgons, while Tamo will oversee the Winkin and develop a training program for them. Mio arrives with vegetable sticks and mayonnaise, surprising Makoto. He enjoys the mayonnaise, as does Shiki, who considers adding it to hot pot. Tamo samples it but prefers the miso she's working on. Mio asks when the miso will be ready, and Tamo says it's almost done. Meanwhile, at the Five Irons, Makoto's students discuss two returning students who have recovered from illness. Despite their good grades, they're known for their bad attitudes, which have caused trouble for both students and teachers. The students doubt Makoto is aware of them and speculate that they won't bother him, as they only target attractive individuals. They're referring to Rembrandt's daughters. The scene shifts to Makoto noticing rain falling in the demiplane. Tamo explains that her theory about the misty door Makoto used last time affecting the demiplane's weather is mostly correct. Mio expresses difficulty in storing food due to the unpredictable weather, while Shiki mentions that so far, the people haven't been greatly affected, but sudden thunderstorms or scorching hot sun could pose problems. Makoto feels that some level of regularity is necessary. Tamo, after collecting data from Makoto's mana, has noticed a link between the misty door and the weather, which is mostly predictable. She plans to find spots where the four seasons can change effortlessly. Makoto says he'll rely on her as he needs to return to Rosgar. Mio wonders if Makoto truly has to leave, sensing reluctance from the Demiplane's resident. Makoto explains that he must go but promises to return as often as possible. The scene shifts to Eris giving Makoto money from his store, indicating their business is doing well. They plan to hire more shopkeepers. As a reward, Makoto gives Aqua and Eris some bananas, which makes them happy. Later, at the academy, Makoto mentions needing special permission for today's lesson. Shiki assures him he has the permit already. Makoto encounters Blight, who wants to buy 10 jars of external wound ointment from Makoto's store. Blight explains that between summer break and the school's anniversary, some students come to class with wounds. Makoto agrees to fulfill the order, and encourages Blight to check out other items in the store. After Blight leaves, Makoto hopes their reputation in the academy isn't being exploited for profit. He notices many love letters on their desks, and Shiki offers to handle them, prioritizing important documents first. Makoto is surprised to find three new students have applied for his class. The scene shifts to the new students introducing themselves to the class. The first, Sifrim Brandt, explains she was sick but has recovered. She specializes in earth and fire magic, with protection from earth spirits. The second, Yuno Rembrandt, is Sif's younger sister, skilled in physical combat preferring the center of the guard. Makoto is pleased they've recovered. The last, Karen Furs, a transfer student from Fusk Royal Academy, has an affinity for water. Shiki and Makoto are wary of her. Makoto tells the Rembrandt sisters he won't show favoritism because of their father's friendship. The boys suspect the sisters are pretending, noting their prior rude behavior. Shiki informs Makoto telepathically that the sisters had a bad reputation for their arrogance and wealth. Despite this, Makoto can't discern it from their appearance. He announces an interesting activity for the day's lesson and leads the older students away. They'll face a summoned opponent. 
The students worry about surviving without showing weakness to the new students. Makoto summons Liddy using his mist gate, secretly instructing him to use only 20% of his strength and refrain from using his breath attack. He assures the students they'll survive if they fight hard. Turning to the new students, he explains they'll be fighting him, with only them attacking. During the fight, Makoto will point out areas for improvement. If they don't improve, he'll start deflecting their attacks. Yuno shoots arrows at Makoto, but he blocks them, deeming them weak. He advises her to infuse mana into her arrows and increase her physical strength. Sif attacks with magic while Karen freezes him. Makoto praises their efforts, noting Karen's timing and Sif's strategy. He advises Sif to control the intensity of battle and increase her speed and Karen to focus on her output strength and effect duration. When Yuno shoots again, Makoto burns away her arrow, criticizing her eagerness for powerful shots. He resolves to defeat them in a memorable way, emphasizing the importance of experiencing failure early on. Meanwhile, other students fight Liddy but are overpowered. By the end, all students are defeated. Makoto announces the end of the lesson and instructs the students to write a report on why they failed. He then asks Karen to join him for a discussion and leaves. The students feel defeated, thinking Makoto's standards are too high. Shiki reassures them that Makoto sets achievable goals and is strict because he believes in their potential. He admits he envies their opportunity for growth. Shiki asks the Rembrandt sisters if they want to continue the class, and they express determination to improve alongside their peers. Abelia suggests discussing the lesson, and the Rembrandt sisters agree. The scene shifts to Makoto speaking with Karen, acknowledging her remarkable strength for a student. Karen explains she served as a mage in the army, offering to share details of her past unit to prove her authenticity. Makoto admits he's already investigated her background but doubts her identity. Karen insists she's genuine and asks if Makoto wants to know her better. Makoto questions Karen about a demon's presence in the academy. Despite Karen's attempt to play dumb, Makoto points out her telltale skin and eye color. Karen resorts to using her magic eye to charm Makoto, but he sees through her attempt. Karen admits surprise at her cover being blown so quickly and threatens Makoto for calling her hornless. Makoto speculates about the real Karen's fate, but Karen claims innocence, blaming her transformation on a friend. She questions Makoto's lack of hostility, noting that humans typically react differently to demons. Makoto expresses his stance against discrimination and willingness to understand others regardless of their race. Karen is astonished by Makoto's ability to speak demon language. Makoto reveals his multilingual skills, but insists on knowing Karen's name. Karen refuses, feeling the need to eliminate Makoto now that her identity is exposed. Shiki identifies Karen as Rona, one of the demon army's four generals, and recalls encountering her when he was a lick. Makoto emphasizes the importance of information in his merchant profession, asserting his advantage. Rona acknowledges the precariousness of her situation and suggests continuing the conversation elsewhere. The scene shifts to the Five Irons where Rona expresses interest in learning more about the Kusanoa Trading Company. She notes the company's presence in Sige and inquires about their intelligence agency there. Makoto clarifies that the company is neither aligned with the human nor demon factions, surprising Rona. He explains that some humans have joined their cause, and it's not unusual for the company to remain neutral. Rona questions if Makoto is becoming an arms dealer, but he clarifies that he simply wants to protect his business interests. While she still harbors distrust, Rona acknowledges Makoto's motives and suggests getting to know each other better. Shiki warns Rona against physical contact with Makoto, but she dismisses it as a shame. Makoto probes Rona about her infiltration of the academy, and she reveals her mission to investigate and address secret human experiments in the city. The scene then shifts to Makoto briefing Lime in his shop about recent demi-human abductions and human trafficking involving the Assassin Guild. Lime pledges to gather information on the matter. Makoto asks Aqua and Eris to assist Lime with his investigation. Initially hesitant to work overtime, they agree when Makoto promises to reward them with bananas. Afterwards, Shiki warns Makoto not to blindly trust Rona's words. Makoto acknowledges this and questions Shiki about his past relationship with her. Shiki explains that they were once partners who exchanged information, but Rona betrayed him and caused trouble. She owes allegiance to the Demon King and is not as powerful as Mio, but Shiki compares her to a less trustworthy version of Mio. Concerned, Makoto asks Shiki to keep an eye on Rona. Later, Makoto visits the Rembrandt sisters and apologizes for not visiting them during their recovery. They remark that Makoto appears kinder outside of class. Makoto requests them to keep his visit confidential and thanks them for their gratitude. He advises them to live happily and fulfillingly. Recalling their father's intention to document their recovery journey, Makoto expresses interest in seeing it. 
The sisters mentioned their efforts in disciplining Morris for suggesting the idea, reflecting on his foolishness. Makoto understands how rumors might have stemmed from this incident and leaves the girls' dorms. Shiki remarks that the Rembrandt sisters are not as terrible as rumored and speculates that the curse might have positively influenced them. Makoto hopes for their growth and a bright future. Meanwhile, Lime investigates the human experiments and discovers new clothing in an abandoned building within the academy compound. Sensing someone's presence, he warns them to halt or face consequences. We then see Aqua and Eris inform Makoto that they were supposed to meet Lime at daybreak, but they can't reach him through telepathy. They explain that Lime's last communication was from the development site of the school compound, and it's unusual for him to engage in combat without direct orders. Makoto believes that even if Lime was ambushed, he wouldn't be easily defeated. Shiki speculates whether Rona might have deceived them, considering her deceitful nature. Makoto cautions against jumping to conclusions prematurely and suggests investigating the crime scene first. Meanwhile, Lime finds himself imprisoned alongside Eva. His katana is missing, and he expresses regret for involving Eva in the situation. Lime recalls the encounter with a powerful white-haired boy who blocked his telepathic communication attempts with Makoto. Despite Lime's attack, the boy easily repelled him and fled after sensing someone approaching. Eva, who had been nearby, attempted to rescue Lime but was also captured by the subsequent arrival. She expresses surprise at the organization's swift abandonment of her. Lime recognizes Eva as the Academy Librarian and informs her that he works for Makoto's company, suggesting that she might know Makoto. Eva expresses her observation that Lime appears more like a bodyguard, to which Lime responds that the roles are essentially the same. He then proposes an escape plan to Eva, who acknowledges the strength of the organization to have established a base in the area. She suspects they have allies within the Academy and believes her escape alone won't make a significant difference. Expressing doubt about Lime's ability to defeat the powerful boy they encountered her, Eva suggests Lime focus on addressing the individuals entrenched within the academy if he intends to rescue her. Lime, curious about his motivation, learns that Eva can provide valuable information to his master, Makoto. She also promises substantial rewards if they dismantle the organization. Agreeing to Eva's proposal, Lime breaks free from captivity using a magical blade from his bracelet. As they attempt to escape, they come across a room filled with experiments involving humans and demi-humans. Shocked by the disturbing sight, Eva speculates that the experiments aim to enhance combat and magical abilities. Unable to contact Makoto telepathically, Lime decides to prioritize freeing the test subjects from their suffering before taking further action. In another place, Shiki and Makoto search for Lime. Shiki detects a dragon nearby, suggesting they may not be facing demons. Makoto considers the possibility that Mitsurugi and Sophia, who claimed alliance with demons, could be involved. Shiki sees this as a chance to avenge Makoto's past injuries, growing eager. However, Lime suddenly appears, surprising them. Lime apologizes for causing worry, and Makoto asks if he encountered any dragons. Lime says no, and Makoto notices Eva with him. Lime promises to give a full report later. Shiki, annoyed by Lime's quick return, is calmed by Makoto. Later, Makoto reads Lime's report, curious about the man who defeated him. Shiki informs Makoto that Eva wants to talk. Makoto asks Shiki to seek Rona's help in uncovering the organization's collaborators in the academy. Shiki agrees, and Makoto speaks with Eva. Eva begins by mentioning the promised information. She reveals familiarity with the individuals in Makoto's portrait. The man, a noble with a significant position in a certain nation, and the woman, a high-ranking priestess. Learning this surprises Makoto who discovers more about his parents' backgrounds. Eva explains that they were supposed to marry in Kaalia, a region of the now-destroyed kingdom of Elysi. However, they were exiled without marrying and disappeared. She admits lacking all the details, as most records were destroyed during an invasion of Kalinia. Makoto understands that Eva is referring to the invasion a decade ago, which resulted in a big win for the demons. Curious, he asks how she knows about his parents. Eva explains she's from Cal and was there during the invasion. Only she and Luria managed to escape. However, they were labeled as cowards for leaving their nation behind. Since then, they've lived quietly, not even using their family names. People still treat them coldly and even harass them sometimes. Despite considering suicide, they decided to reclaim Kaelni, or at least the lost lands of the Insland family. This led Eva to make a deal with an organization opposing the goddess. They exchanged technology and knowledge, making them powerful. She thought they could help reclaim Kaelni, but she encountered Lime and they got captured. Understanding her plight, Makoto promises to protect her. Later that night, Makoto ponders the potential involvement of the powerful organization in the ongoing war against the demons. 
Sensing someone approaching, Lime alerts him that the white-haired boy is heading their way. Tamo and Mio arrive, surprising Makoto, who questions their presence. Mio instructs Lime to leave, but Tamo insists Lime would only hinder them. Lime departs to the demiplane, and the boy arrives in their room. He identifies himself as the guildmaster of the Adventurers Guild and apologizes for his actions against Lime. Makoto and the others are taken aback by this revelation. Before explaining his purpose, the guildmaster requests some fruit from Neo. Initially hesitant, Mio complies upon Makoto's insistence. Makoto queries the guildmaster's reason for being there, prompting the guildmaster to assure him that there's no need for written communication, as he's not human. Makoto pretends not to understand, but the guildmaster speculates whether Makoto is worried about being discovered by the goddess. He reassures Makoto that the goddess is unaware of his current situation and has been making errors lately. Makoto decides to speak up and asks the boy who he is. The boy begins to introduce himself, but Tamo interrupts, revealing that he is Ludo, also known as Banshoku, a greater dragon undefeated in battles. Makoto acknowledges that greater dragons are the most powerful among their kind, listing some famous ones. Ludo insists Shin shouldn't interfere when he's talking to Makoto, but Tamo corrects him, stating she no longer goes by that name and introduces herself. Ludo assures Makoto he's not deceiving him and tries to get closer, but Tamo warns him off with her sword and questions when he became a man. Ludo explains it happened 300 years ago when he grew tired of being a woman. He recounts a transformative experience after a one-night encounter with a man, claiming he can charm Makoto even though he's a virgin. Makoto, feeling uncomfortable, creates some distance. Mio arrives with the fruit and inquires about the situation. Ludo explains that his actions are aimed at maintaining balance in the world. He criticizes the humans for becoming too numerous and arrogant under the goddess's rule. According to him, the guild system helps control this by encouraging people to strive for higher levels and ranks. He's intentionally made the growth rate tied to these levels to motivate individuals. Joining the guild ignites people's ambitions, leading them to desire success until they are overwhelmed by their own desires, which ultimately reduces the human population. Tamo finds this method indirect for preserving balance. Ludo reveals that the highest level in the guild is 65,535, a number reminiscent of old video games. Makoto questions how Ludo, a thousand-year-old human, knows about video games, but Ludo explains the time difference between their worlds. Despite his complex explanation, Makoto remains confused. He inquires about his chances of returning home, and Ludo admits it's nearly impossible due to the randomness of teleportation at his current mana level, estimating a 1 in 10 million chance of success. Makoto recalls Shiki mentioning a similar probability. Ludo advises Makoto to explore this world for now and takes his leave. Tamo escorts him out to prevent further trouble and asks on their way if humans from Makoto's world truly die at 100 years of age. The scene changes to Lime telling Makoto about his investigation plans, but Rona disrupted it with threats, seduction, and lies. Shiki adds that Rona didn't even try to keep the investigation secret. Makoto senses Shiki's disapproval of Rona's behavior and hopes they can reconcile. However, Shiki firmly states he can't trust Rona because she's deceitful and untrustworthy. Despite this, Makoto acknowledges that Rona quickly identified people linked to them and that even the forest ogres dislike her revealing attire. He finds the investigation's outcome surprising and starts to doubt all humans. Planning to discuss future plans with Rona, Makoto meets her at Five Irons. Rona informs Makoto she's achieved her goal and will leave the city, asking if he'll manage the organization. She apologizes for Karen's absence from his class, arranging for the academy to be notified of her death during summer break. Makoto suggests not revealing Karen's death, but citing family circumstances instead to avoid shocking others. Agreeing, Rona suggests improving the ethics and methods of Makoto's undercover agents to be more effective in espionage. Makoto thanks her, and Karen praises him for treating all beings equally. Despite Karen offering him an audience with the Demon King, Makoto declines. Rona advises him to cut ties with the forest ogres and Shiki, warning they may betray him one day due to their brutish nature. Makoto acknowledges the risk but believes he can prevent it as long as he keeps providing bananas to the ogres. Rona tells Makoto that Shiki isn't fully human or demon but possessed. Makoto disagrees, saying Shiki's appearance is natural. Rona reveals Shiki was known as larva among demons, with mixed interactions. She warns Makoto not to trust Shiki, larva, and Makoto agrees. Rona advises Makoto to be careful and gives him a paper to contact her telepathically for demon cooperation. Then she disappears. Makoto shares it with Tamo, who thinks it might help with a cursed item issue. Tamo suspects Rona's motives of seeking Makoto's favor. 
Makoto decides to stay alert and recalls Lime's normal conversations. He asks if Lime is still human, shocked to learn Tamo gave Lime her blood. Tamo ponders her actions, and Makoto vows to be stricter. He feels urgency in dealing with the organization for Eva and Luria's safety, but Tamo and Mio offer to help. Makoto insists on handling it alone. Later, he interrogates Blight, who apologizes for his subordinate's deeds. Blight admits he underestimated Makoto's abilities. Makoto modestly credits his exceptional followers. Blight implies Makoto must be aware of the organization. Makoto confirms he is. Blight warns of consequences if Makoto acts against him, citing his worldwide allies. Makoto counters that he's already been abandoned by them, with no rescue or word from the assassination guild. Blight is surprised Makoto knows about the guild. Makoto questions why Blight didn't just fulfill his role as a teacher. Makoto argues Blight, being human, has no reason to defy the goddess. Blight counters that the goddess is the only deity in their world, often capricious in her treatment of humans, sparking numerous wars. He believes the goddess is unfit to rule and that humans can thrive without her. Blight criticizes those who overlook her faults due to her divine status. Makoto questions why Blight involved demi-humans in his experiments if he feels this way. Blight argues that humans sacrifice themselves, so it's natural for demi-humans to do the same. Makoto, fed up, kills Blight. The scene shifts to the academy, where students plan their summer break. The Rembrandt sisters arrive, and everyone makes way for them. Ilumban's friends notice the sisters, hearing rumors of their improved behavior. However, another student claims they've been causing trouble, including Professor Blyke's resignation. Ilumban feels uneasy but brushes it off, deciding to take more medicine. Elsewhere, Makoto's students discuss Karen's departure due to family issues. Abelia suggests Sif and Yuno join their next practice with Liddy, a formidable opponent. They strategize to overcome Liddy's defenses, eventually devising a plan. In Makoto's final class before summer, he introduces another lizard man named Sway. The students are surprised by the new addition, but Makoto explains they won't learn much by always outnumbering their opponents. Abelia questions if Sif and Yuno have equal strength, and Makoto confirms they do. The students are then defeated by them, feeling their planning was futile. Later, Makoto informs Shiki about Rembrandt's request to bring his daughters home, seeking advice. Jean interrupts, informing Makoto the students want to speak with him. They request summer training, willing to pay for it. Makoto ponders if this is their collective desire. Sif and Yuno express their willingness to stay for six months and ask for training. Makoto asks Shiki to check his schedule, but Shiki suggests only one lesson per week, which disappoints Makoto. Seeing the eager faces of his students, he agrees to weekly lessons but insists Sif and Yuno return home for part of the break due to their recovery, which they reluctantly accept. Meanwhile, Eva searches for a book to thank Makoto for his protection. Although he declines her offer of land, she resolves to find a suitable book instead. The students finally defeat Liddy, and Shiki praises their effort. After healing, they face a stronger Liddy but are overpowered. The scene shifts to the other students fighting Zwei, where Miss Ra urges Sif to finish him off, angering Zwei. Sif holds back, leading Zwei to defeat them easily. Later, Makoto apologizes to the students for their defeat against Zwei. They inquire about Sway's sudden increase in strength. Makoto reveals that blue lizards like Sway are actually stronger than low-ranking dragons, and they had been holding back during their fights. The students are surprised by this revelation and question why Sway used more strength towards the end. Makoto explains that Sway is female, and when they insulted her, she became angry. Despite this setback, Makoto encourages them not to give up and suggests a rematch. Afterward, Makoto treats them to dinner at Five Irons, and they leave in good spirits. Makoto asks Shiki if he advised them, and Shiki confirms he suggested they raise their levels by fighting monsters. Makoto recalls they are adventurers' guild members and could benefit from the pervert dragon system if they level up. He trusts they won't become overly ambitious. Shiki assures Makoto they will be fine, as he directed them to a safe leveling spot. Makoto appreciates the help but acknowledges they won't be completely safe. He gets an idea and wonders if they still have bananas in the shop. The scene shifts to the students defeating monsters in the wild, gaining eight levels in one day. They credit Shiki in Makoto's lessons for their progress. Abelia expresses her affection for Shiki. They set up camp for the night and encounter a demodragon the next day. Despite their average level of 75, they attempt to fight it. However, the dragon paralyzes them with its roar and prepares to attack with its breath. Eris intervenes, capturing the dragon with her magic and defeating it with ice magic before disappearing. Confused, the students wonder who Eris is, while Makoto silently acknowledges that the bananas were the reason they were saved. This bring an end to our episode. We find Makoto approaching the guildmaster with a determined expression, 
expressing his desire to enhance his mana. The guild master is taken aback, questioning Makoto's intentions as he already possesses more mana than most others. Makoto clarifies that he seeks to increase the amount of mana he can wield at once. The guild master warns Makoto about the common belief that one's mana capacity cannot be expanded. He cautions Makoto that if any research organization discovers his increased mana level, they may subject him to extensive studies. Makoto's friend marvels at his determination and asks for the secret behind his strength. Makoto modestly explains that he simply practices arc pulling daily and gifts his friend a book on mana training techniques, considering his friend's roles as a teacher, merchant, and aspiring scholar. Expressing gratitude, Makoto accepts the book, eagerly anticipating the upcoming summer break. He recalls feeling tense before vacations, filled with plans and aspirations. His friend bids him a joyful break as the scene transitions to the academy. Makoto engages in conversation with Eva, the librarian, who commends him for his dedication to training students during the summer holidays. She notes the absence of many full-time teachers on vacation, expressing her gratitude for teachers like Makoto who remain committed to their duty. Eva hands Makoto a book she specially selected for him, knowing his keen interest in mana usage. She explains that she chose this book for him due to its unique theories tailored for those with discerning tastes in science, believing Makoto will appreciate its contents as a fellow enthusiast of mana manipulation. Makoto expresses his intrigue about the book but mentions he has other plans for the summer break. Eva chuckles at his enthusiasm, remarking that he sounds just like a student. As the summer days pass swiftly, Makoto finds himself engrossed in various activities, including reading, training, and attending to administrative tasks. Two weeks fly by, and we see Makoto strolling with Emma, who apologizes for her busy schedule filled with approvals and reports. Makoto reassures her, mentioning that once the break ends, he'll be occupied with responsibilities again. He expresses his desire to spend as much time as possible with everyone before then. Emma, touched by his sentiments, expresses her gratitude for having a president like him and becomes emotional. Makoto consoles her and suggests focusing on the day's agenda. The scene shifts to Makoto's determination as he prepares for a training battle with the wing, a formidable opponent known for their strength and aerial advantage. The battle takes place in the forest, out of sight from prying eyes. Emma bids Makoto luck and departs, leaving him to face the wing alone. As the wing group appears in the sky, Makoto initiates the encounter by launching magical shots, effectively hitting each member. He observes their vulnerability to long-range attacks and their weak defense, identifying potential strategies to exploit their weakness. Makoto launches magical projectiles at the wing and swiftly switches to using fire to target them. He reflects on Emma's warning about the wing's strength, but finds them to be little more than airborne targets. Suddenly, President Kaiken arrives, riding atop a bird schooner, which surprises Makoto as he realizes the wind can transform into such creatures. He ponders how they will handle long-range attacks. Undeterred, Makoto continues his barrage, but both the bird and President Kaiken remain unaffected. The bird then employs a reinforcement and wind spell, signaling a suicidal attack. Makoto discerns their intentions and braces himself as the bird charges towards him. He seizes the bird by its beak and forcefully slams it to the ground. President Kaiken then confronts Makoto, and the bird reverts to Shunei. As Makoto prepares to counter with fire, President Kaiken yields, signaling an end to the battle. Makoto and Emma stand before the wing, where Makoto candidly remarks on their over-reliance on flight ability. He warns them that in future encounters, Arcs and others will exploit this weakness. Additionally, he advises against suicide attacks, which make them easy targets for concentrated fire. He encourages the wing to hone their skills and strive for improvement. Makoto responds, unsure whether the person is a boy or a girl, but the individual clarifies that they are indeed a boy. They address Makoto as their lord and express their desire to join in developing and exploring the land, as well as arranging the secondary space. Makoto explains that everyone can contribute to arranging the secondary space, but it's ultimately his responsibility. However, he gently explains that the boy's abilities aren't quite suited for the task of developing the secondary space. This disappoints the boy, and tears well up in his eyes. Makoto consoles him, urging him not to cry and instead focus on developing his strength. Later, as evening falls, Makoto sits on the balcony, contemplating outer space. He speaks to himself, referencing a book, explaining that when a large amount of mana is continuously released, it can create a weak barrier of colored mana. This barrier becomes visible as mana is released, eventually becoming tangible. Frustrated, Makoto flips off his chair, feeling overwhelmed and exclaiming that he doesn't understand anything, feeling that such discussions are only comprehensible to nobles and those of exceptional intelligence. 
The scene shifts to Makoto walking with Kudo in the forest, discussing mana. Makoto asserts that simply releasing mana is sufficient, demonstrating his immense power by continuously releasing a barrier while unleashing a massive amount of mana. Like a tank cannon, he fires rapid, large shots of mana. Suddenly, he experiences a peculiar sensation, feeling as though he's been transported to another world. In the early morning, Makoto wakes up to the surprise of Mio and Tomo calling out to him. They question why he wasn't in his room all night, as it's unusual for him to sleep outside. Makoto explains that he spent the night releasing the barrier and pondering matters, feeling like it's something he's experienced before. Grateful for their help, he suggests they return to their rooms. Confused, Mio and Tomo exchange looks, unsure why Makoto is thanking them. They head back home, where Mio prepares a delicious breakfast. Makoto expresses his gratitude for the meal, but Mio humbly admits that she's still learning. Meanwhile, Tomo eyes the food, particularly the khaki and mashed tofu salad, but quickly restrains herself, following the etiquette of eating what's in front of her first and using her right hand. Makoto gets in touch with Tomo, curious if she truly adores the khaki from the secondary space. Tomo enthusiastically confirms her love for it, jokingly imagining burying herself in a mountain of khaki someday. Makoto chuckles and advises her not to take her love for khaki too far. Soon after, Mayo chimes in, warning Tomo to behave or risk losing her khaki privileges. After several days, Makoto is seen once again practicing with mana. He's finally mastered the technique of creating a barrier outside his body. With a newfound skill, he unleashes spells rapidly, resembling a machine gun. Determined not to lose consciousness this time, Makoto recalls studying this method diligently from a book. He employs a combination of techniques, including eyebrow kai to conceal his barrier, before chanting mysterious hymns and words to unleash his full power. Surprised by the outcome, Makoto marvels at the physical manifestation of mana, which obediently follows his movement. He tests his newfound strength by headbutting a tree, shattering it without feeling any pain. Confident in his ability, Makoto resolves to face any formidable foe, even the Dragon Slayer, without fear of injury. For the sake of the secondary space, Makoto is willing to sacrifice himself if necessary, preferring to bear the burden of conflict alone and shield others from harm. The morning arrived, marking the midpoint of Makoto's summer break. Curious about his newfound ability, Makoto voiced his question aloud. Timo, one of his companions, explained that these abilities were actually skills learned by Makoto's students who were training diligently in the secondary space. They were eager to demonstrate their progress to him. Intrigued, Makoto agreed to witness their achievements. To showcase their skills, they set up a large rock for everyone to demonstrate their magic on, with the strength of their spells measured by the impact. Shiki was eager to showcase his magic, but Mei, not interested in the competition, suggested a cooking contest instead. The competition commenced with the High Orcs, represented by Agares and Emma. While Emma was recognized as the most powerful sorceress among the High Orcs, she typically handled various tasks. Nonetheless, she displayed impressive magical prowess, earning 78 points alongside her friend, much to Tamar's amazement. Next up were the Fog Lizards, who unleashed their formidable power into the sky. Makoto, puzzled by their display, sought an explanation from Tamawai. She speculated that they were perhaps trying to impress the winged beings. The Fog Lizard's performance earned them 68 points. Now, Makoto successfully breaks the ice barrier on the rock. MW announces that it's their turn next. Temoi questions MW's sudden interest in combat skills, given their previous disinterest. MW clarifies that although they aren't keen on new skills, they didn't want to miss the chance to showcase another hobby besides cooking. Makoto inquires if MW is referring to what they saw on the memory vault. Then, Mayu employs her magic to create a prototype hero suit, signaling the beginning of the final participation. Meanwhile, Shiki arrives, prompting Tamo to note his apparent acquisition of a new ability. Shiki demonstrates his power by wielding his massive sword, earning admiration from Tamo. She recalls that the dwarves crafted the weapon for him with the intent to challenge dragons, hence earning him the moniker Demon Slayer. Anticipating a future battle against Mitsurugi, Makoto, with Shiki's assistance, strikes the rock and finally manages to break it. Makoto praises Shiki's physical prowess, despite acknowledging its ineffectiveness against dragons. Tamo commends Makoto's efforts, but reminds him of the importance of accuracy in combat. She reassures him that Shiki is observing their progress and training, highlighting Makoto's role as an example for him. Additionally, she suggests the possibility of showcasing her own skills, a sentiment echoed by Mio, who anticipates Makoto unveiling a new skill. As Makoto unleashes his magic, everyone watches in amazement. Makoto internally notes that this is the first time he's wielded such a large amount of mana without using the brow of Kai. 
His magical display leaves everyone astonished. Shaky remarks that Makoto's power has manifested in its most concentrated form. Makoto elaborates, explaining that his magic amplifies his spells and acts as a robust shield. With a strike of his magic, Makoto destroys the target, evoking fear among the spectators. Despite his accomplishment, Makoto seeks their opinions, but nobody responds. Reflecting later, Makoto realizes he got carried away by the excitement of the moment. Addressing Tadets, Makoto expresses concern about a potential threat posed by a bear he encountered, emphasizing the need for action. This bring an end to our episode 11. If you enjoyed it then don't forget to like, share and subscribe our channel, Annie Explainer.